So here's the third game in the correspondence series. Looking at driving forward the creative, logical thinking process or the logical creative process as we like to call it. Again we're playing black here. So we push through the center, we just get straight into it because I think now we understand what we mean by the creative logical thinking. So we look to um, attempt something slightly different for our usual play. So we're bringing the bishop out here looking to target towards the king area but realistically looking for more central management with the bishop because like I say I'm not too much of a fan of the knight coming here to there unless of course they don't go and castle then we can take advantage of it so the key square is here for now willing to bring it back if he does open his pawn to support the attack on the knight if anything happens so in a small creative zone just bringing it here to look to manage this square they develop the knight so they've not gone and castled, so that, that, has, that has been noted. So we're basically looking again, as usual, if they don't go and castle and they spend too much time developing pieces but not keeping the king safe, maybe we can take advantage of that. So there's not too much major issues with the opponent's movements at this stage. So we're looking to just basically sort our own bed out, sort our own house out, get everything in order making space for castling potential and then the opponent in my eyes brings the knight down to lose tempo because this is the idea that we talked about where you know if you put your bishop here then you know you're looking you know for that type of thing attacking here but then it ends up being you exchange the bishop and the knight for a rook I have seen it work, I have used it myself against um, people, but it is a lot of work and there's no real sort of guarantee that you're going to get a good position, all depending on what the opponent does. The clever player will sit back, if you've exchanged your knight and a bishop for a rook, they'll sit back and position themselves because they know that they've got stronger pieces to work with, so they'll get their team working together a lot better. Don't see it that often, but you know, um, the ones that have done it to me in the past, or I've done it to other people, I've just um, gathered my pieces together, my stronger pieces, worked on an open file, and was able to manage um, advantages through the game. So it's not really always a good thing going for this exchange. So we castle. And the opponent pushes the pawn down, so they've not actually gone for the exchange. So in my head, immediately I'm going, I think the opponent's suffering from um, creative syndrome. Yep, their brain has gone, right, I can attack here to stop them from doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, but I won't attack it straight away. I'm going to open up my bishop to then establish another attack line somewhere. And all the while, while they're doing this, like this pawn basically is like a soft move the knight move here was a soft move so when we mentioned soft moves as we mentioned in the previous videos it's about me thinking well that loses you tempo so in essence they've lost one tempo there one tempi there one tempi with this pawn here and also the fact of not being able to castle that's like three three moves behind so we just want to see what the knight actually wants to do because we're not fearful of the exchange of the knight and the bishop for the rook but the opponent takes the knight back so losing more tempo and more time so I utilize this knowledge so that hopefully I don't fall into this um, sort of situation of losing time and developing pieces so we look now to open up our bishop we like, we like to attack here and um, wouldn't have any interest in actually bringing the bishop to this point here because at this moment in time the opponent is down tempi so let's get rid of this um, power base bishop that he's got here and they do another soft move again losing tempo so we bring the bishop as we said to attack their bishop and their bishop then does 
what I would class as a soft move because it's moved itself out of the way now it's attacking our knight we don't have any problems doubling pawns if he does do that so he's falling way behind on in movement tempo and advantage on the board so we can now bring our knight through <coughs> potential for attacking the knight here potential for attacking the pawn here also it's done a reversal and it's attacking the bishop again so the bishop comes back losing again more tempi as we've mentioned uh, gauge bar showing in our favor but you know um, i'm more interested in how i'm feeling in the game and at this moment in time the opponent has lost maybe about five tempi he's not gone on castle this king is still airy and so i don't know if there's an issue on this um uh, in this particular game but um that seems fairly key at this moment not gone and castled the king side that's happened in the previous two games i think where they've not castled early enough at all so the advantage has been taken in pushing our pieces and making them do things they don't want to do and then the king has ended up being squished so now we're looking at basically simply taking pieces off the board because we must be about 6 p up so we might as well take advantage of this 6 p up positionally on the board feeling a lot stronger we've got a lot more management it might not look like anything yeah because they've got the knights out they've got the bishop there they've got the queen there and the king can go and castle at any stage but it's those moments of it's how can i put it i'm going to try and make it as simple as possible it's like running a hundred meter race so i'm racing against my opponent now in a hundred meters race the gun gets fired so it gets shot so then we start running but our opponent stays on the stocks for a few seconds you know they're they're going oh i'm gonna play it safe it's okay no problem so we start off and we're, we're sprinting away they then decide to run but they're running to the left and then they're running a little bit to the right and then they're running a little bit to the left again and they're not running in a straight line they're, they're thinking of all these different avenues that they can actually run the hundred meters when the actual goal of the hundred meters is to get to the end so from what the opponent has shown here is they understand the the art of chess they're making moves but the moves aren't actually achieving the goal of what chess is about they're doing a zigzag run to get to the end of a hundred meter race whereas i'm going straight and i'm almost at the finish line so they capture and we bring the bishop through now so obviously it's x-raying through to the king so expecting them to go and castle at any stage but I'm more interested now in just taking pieces off the ball because our position is um, more advantageous. As I say, when you look at the board, you, you don't see anything magical or mystical. There's, how can you say you, you're actually winning? There's potential for grabbing this pawn as well, you know, because if we do take the knight, there's going to be the smallest of advantages there as we're building through. So this is the straight line run on the 100 meters not the zigzag run so then they move the king as mentioned before it's a three day three day move for each of us so we've got maximum three days to make a move and i think in the last game the opponent made a similar type move this isn't the same opponent this is a different opponent where they brought their queen down and it was in the line of the bishop we have three days to make moves so there's no real you, there's no element of mouse clicking you know like in the blitz games or the bullet games you know where you can accidentally move the piece or just drag it and drop it in the in, a, in the wrong plate position so again this is an error in judgment an error in calculation because it's not properly castled this rook is out of the game completely so again that is not the straight run on 100 meters this is definitely a zigzag u-turn having a look at the um the scenery in the background looking at the starting point going full circle again and 
probably attempting to aim back to the direction in which you were supposed to go in, which is the finish line. So we capture, and then the queen comes down. Knight can basically just take stuff off the board now. Um, there's a nice position here, um, which is nicely eyed up. If we look in future tense, as we see in the finish line, the queen can come here, the rook can get to this part, this section here, lining up for an attack potentially onto this area here. Only thing that's blocking it is this pawn for now. Potentially, the pawn can take the bishop or the pawn can take the knight. So, got options, but we're open to suggestions. But the main key area is seeing if we can get this line towards the king. So, the queen takes the knight, saves our bishop. So, our bishop now is looking fairly tasty on this angle here. So, as we mentioned, we can still potentially bring the queen across. So, changing the traje trajectory a little bit from this square now to this square. So all we need to do now is maneuver the knight out of the way somehow, capturing whichever, trying to get this pawn opened up, so then now we can target this area here. So that's future tensing, that's the creative mind going, but now we're trying to logicalize it by making appropriate movements. Queen moves, so we move the king because as we demonstrated in the last game as well, when the opponent had a last ditch attempt at a beautiful checkmate position. Now if we were asleep we wouldn't have we wouldn't have seen it. Because the opponent's basically looking at getting this I call them cheap moves, because they do work, but it's like, you know, it's so basic. Yeah. Um, when we played the 2700 stockfish, um, it came out with such basic moves that I almost got upset with the fact that it was so basic. Yes, it won because we'd made an error earlier on in the um, opening part of the game. But we could see what he, the computer was attempting to go for. And there was no magic to it. It was just a nice, gentle build-up of simple basic attacks and um, that I couldn't really defend against that towards the end but there was nothing mysterious about it so I can still call them cheap because I'm like going wow you know <laughs> I can see it but I can't do anything about it and it's just going to keep putting the pressure on so I can still call it cheap uh, because it's not grand it's not um, um, a mysterious type magical maneuver that I hadn't seen so we move the king. Now, if we hadn't moved the king, we would have lost a bit of tempo, and the opponent would have spoiled all the beautiful work that we had created for ourselves. We're up a minor piece. It's easy to get caught into the fact that yes, you're up a minor piece, or you're winning, or you think your position is really strong. That has been my downfall in playing, and from the history of all the games that I've recorded and played. Um, both on my personal account and also on Chess Gym's account here. Basically, they highlight the weaknesses that I found out from in my evaluation and analysis of all my games is I get good positions in an attacking formation and when I don't look at my blind spots, I don't look at the back end, I don't look at what the opponent is good, can do to me, that's when games are lost. And that's quite infuriating because all that beautiful work has just gone to waste and the opponent may not be as skilled as yourself but yet they found a way of utilizing the answer process because that's basically where it's come from you know the answer process why is it i was losing all the time or losing advantages i was like pieces up or i was pawns up etc and then losing games and came to the fact of after the research looked at um, all you know loads of games and people use the answer process they attack the king area they find a, a pattern a way of actually getting towards the king and probably getting a checkmate simple as and it's not it's not anything glamorous but there's loads of chess players that fall for this type of thing 
So, yeah, it's so crucial to look at the back end. This game and the previous game fall right into that, where beautiful work has been done by myself, and then the opponent does have a glimmer of hope in terms of attacking the king area. If I was asleep and I hadn't sorted my bed out, they would have taken advantage of that. So we moved the king, so now they have to think of something else. So we bring the bishop back because we want to maintain the pressure on this pawn because we have a picture in sight as we mentioned with the rook and potentially the queen here this pawn has got no protection on it so i can't envisage that that's going to last too long the queen sees this so now it's now they've come back so how do we then fashion our attack process we have options either bringing the rook here challenging the pawn if the pawn takes at this moment in time we would lose out so we could bring the queen here looking to support this attack because he does have his bishop as well on here there's a challenge so it pushes the pawn down okay it's not this to me i'm thinking okay there's an idea the opponents use it attempting to utilize the answer process you know put pressure on the king area keep it all tight but what they're um, negating is the fact that we can look for the exchange if the queen does move then we are starting to pressurize this pawn area and we'll be allowed to push through the center we'll be allowed to get the queen onto this side here depending on what the opponent does so we're trying to reverse the attack pressure that they've got on us so the queen does move so now our queen can come to the magical square here we've got two on there at the minute got to remember he's got two on there as well his queen and his king sometimes people forget that the king has the power to actually capture back as well so we have to be mindful of that so this is why we're potentially wanting a third in there which is the rook so the bishop moves obviously looking to try and get his rook into the into the game here his poor king because it's not castled we're hoping to try and smother it we're not looking to pressure it nice and you know in an aggressive way just building the pieces up nice and steadily So we push through the centre now, uh, rightly or wrongly, um, Gage Bar is not, not unhappy with that. So basically we wanted to try and get this action going at some stage. So the Rook does come across and as the arrows show we, we're really going strong and hard for this. We could actually go but we're not going to do that just yet. I think potentially, whoops, taking the pawn makes sense because it allows us to have all three on this pawn which is potentially probably looking for his rook to come down and drop so capture so now we do have the magical position and they capture so we don't really want to exchange off so we could now go because we've got the three yep and he's got two on there which is his king and his queen we can now look to take the queen off the board with a check on the king so the capture capture with the rook and we're also on the bishop so it's like a double attack so all pretty clinical at this moment then we capture now the king is stuck on the back so we bring the rook up now looking to for a background checkmate but this actually checkmate itself so that was the creative creative side of development but log logicalizing that creative element looking at the safety aspect you know covering off the the potential attack from the opponent and building on that to basically say well logically yes we can defend here but we want to be able to have a counter-attacking type of position as well so that we're not just defending defending we want to be able to come back with something against the opponent especially because his king hasn't been castled there must be something that we can actually do against this type of situation